everything out of the cannabis transaction through the entire supply chain. Um, if, if, if the simplest model is uh, PayPal, Forbes magazine has labeled us the PayPal for pot, um, and we certainly like that uh, moniker. So thank you, thank you for having me, and hopefully we can give you guys some really valuable information tonight. Hello, hello, perfect. Hi, my name is Ali. I am the founder and CEO of Event High. Uh, event High is an event uh, management platform, uh, very similar to Eventbrite. Uh, if some of you purchase your tickets for this event on Eventbrite, we're very similar, but for cannabis events only. Um, so we have a marketplace for buyers and sellers to come in and uh, create events, publish them, sell tickets, and for uh, buyers to come in and find different experiences and purchase tickets for cannabis-related events. Uh, we actually were one of the first companies in California to obtain an MRB bank account um, through uh, a bank in Colorado to uh, operate uh, legitimately and safely uh, as a cannabis software company. Great. Uh, my name is Andre Herrera, and I am EVP of Banking and Compliance with Hyper. We are a regulatory technology and payment company for financial institutions. My background is banking, so I've been in financial services over 26 years now. 18 of those, I was chief information officer of a bank here in California. I also managed credit card portfolios of 300,000 cards. I was an early adopter in the stored value. I did ACH aggregation. Anything moving money electronically, anything from a regulatory or banking technology side, I was involved in. And started with Hyper. I was actually the first employee of Hyper in 2014. Great. Thank you for that. So as you guys see, we have a very well-rounded uh, speaking panel, whether it's the first MRB account or the company providing the framework for banks and credit unions, or furthermore, the payment solution that's becoming the PayPal pod. Um, so to start off, Andre, can you kind of speak to what is the current landscape of banking at the federal and local level? All right, well, why don't we start out with a question for the audience. So, so who in the audience thinks that banking, marijuana-related businesses, is illegal? <laughs> All right, well, it, it is illegal. So from a federal standpoint, the banking of marijuana-related businesses is federally illegal. Now, back until when Sessions took care of the, uh, the coal memorandum, we had the coal memorandum, and then we had the FinCEN guidance. And so the Cole Memorandum, of course, set the enforcement priorities to where if you were following these enforcement priorities, if you were doing things right, that the, the DOJ was going to leave you alone. All right, well, Sessions took care of that about two months ago. And so what does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with the FinCEN guidance. And so FinCEN is part of the Department of Treasury. And this was basically a, a regimen of what should a bank be doing if they're accepting, or credit union for that matter, if they're accepting marijuana-related deposits? And so they, they came up with this regimen as far as suspicious activity reports. And they're saying, all right, here's some red flags to look out for. Here's some best practices in the underwriting of these accounts. And also, you have to file these special reports. All right, as of last month, there are approximately 400 institutions across the United States that are actively accepting deposits for marijuana-related businesses. Now, does that make it any easier for a bank to get into space? Well, you know, the answer is no, because basically you still have something that is federally illegal, but it's somewhat permitted by policy, at least by that FinCEN guidance. You know, when we first started looking at, at the marijuana banking issue, a lot of people said, all right, this is, it, it's a payments problem. We gotta make, we gotta make payments. We have, to, we have to pay our bills. I have to be able to write checks, do electronic payments. And, and then we said, well, it's not really a payments problem, it's, it's a banking problem, all right? And then, then we have companies such as, as our company that created solutions to enable these financial institutions to bank the space. And so it's not really a banking problem anymore, but, but it's really down to the lack of banks and credit unions. So there, there simply aren't enough institutions that are in the space willing to take these accounts. You know, there's, there's not a silver bullet. There's not a one-size-fits-all. Fits all. You, know, you, can't, you can't just go and buy a book and then start banking marijuana. And every bank is so uniquely different. You, know, you can take two banks or five banks that are exactly the same asset size, that are very similar in their profiles, but it may not be appropriate for those institutions or any of them or, or, or all of them to start accepting marijuana deposits. So you have this federal layer that exists. And then you also have all these different regulators at the federal side. So you've got the FDIC, you got the OCC, you got the FRB, and then on the credit union side, you have the NCUA. 
And it's hard to have consistency across all those regulators. And so you may be dealing with the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco, and they have one attitude towards cannabis banking, which I think is a very good attitude for the space. And then you may have the Federal Reserve Bank, say, like in New York, that has a very different attitude. And so even from the same regulator across the US, you, you have, you know, your mileage may vary. And so you have different opinions on what they're comfortable with doing. Now, outside the federal level, you also have the state layer as well. And so state chartered institutions in California, they are regulated by the Department of Business Oversight. And so you have that state authority, that state regulator that comes into the state chartered institutions as well. And you're having to deal with those institutions you know, on the banking you know, of cannabis. When I look at banking of cannabis, it's really not like any other banking product. All right? It's not right for every institution to get in there. Not every institution does car loans. Not every institution does mortgage loans. And if a bank or credit union does something wrong in that space, they're going to get their hands slapped. Well, it's no different for cannabis, except you still have that, that, that federally illegal standpoint. Great, thank you for that. Um, Ken, so considering there are banking solutions out there, but they're not widely available, at least at this moment, how can current operators mitigate the current banking challenges? Well, first and foremost, you've got to understand what the bank is looking at. You know, what's important to the bank? Um, what are their compliance do obligations? And if you can put yourselves in the shoes of the bank, then you're going to have a much better chance of getting a bank account and keeping your bank account at that bank. So starting with that premise, the first thing that a bank is going to look at is transparency. They have something, an obligation under the Bank Secrecy Act called their Know Your Customer Due Diligence Obligations. They need to know their customers. They need to know what business their customers are in, how they're operating their business, who owns those businesses. And so when you apply for a bank account, you really need to be completely and totally transparent with your banker. Let them know exactly what you're doing and do not surprise them ever. And you've got to really gain their trust that yes, you're in the cannabis space, but you are dotting all of your I's and crossing all of your T's and doing an incredible amount of internal compliance within your cannabis business to make sure you're operating in compliance with state law, whatever state you're in, and in our opinion that you're also not implicating any of the eight enforcement priorities in the Cole Memo. And if you're not familiar with the Cole Memo, Google it. It was rescinded by Jeff Sessions on January 4th of this year. However, if you read his rescission letter, it basically says local U.S. attorneys can already know what type of prosecutorial discretion to use to decide who to go after and who not to go after. We don't need the Cole Memo. A number of local U.S. attorneys have already come out and said, yes, the Cole Memo's been rescinded, but it's still our guidepost. And they're basically eight bad boy acts, selling to minors, having firearms on your premises, shipping cannabis across state lines, being a front for drug cartels. If you're implicating any of these eight bad boy acts, the DOJ is going to come after you. That's what the US, local U.S. attorneys are going to go after. So make sure, notwithstanding that it was rescinded, that you're still adhering to it. So just to surmise, or to, to summarize, be completely and totally transparent with your bank because of the due diligence obligations that they're going to have to go through to know you. Make sure you're operating in compliance with state law and make sure your business is not implicating any of the eight enforcement priorities in the Cole Memo. And, and one more item with respect to compliance. Um, compliance, a priority on compliance comes from the top. It comes from the owners of the business and it flows down. If the owners of the business don't take compliance seriously, nobody else in the company is going to take compliance seriously. So that's number one. The owners of the business have to buy in and have to make compliance a priority. Number two, one of the best ways that they can do that in that cannabis business is to appoint a chief compliance officer for that cannabis company and give that compliance officer the appropriate authority to do their job to discipline employees who are not operating in compliance with what's required under state law or are doing things, consuming cannabis on premises, et cetera, um, that's going to get you in trouble. And if you make compliance a priority within your business, your bank's going to see that. And they're going to realize that you're going to have a much better chance of getting your bank account and of keeping a bank account. Great. Thank you. The idea of having a chief compliance officer, I think, is extremely crucial. Um, 
especially with the fact that all these temporary licenses are going to be expiring in the next month or so, with the annual licenses coming online, the Bureau is really going to be looking at how have you been operating under your temporary license. And hopefully m most of these operators are aware of that and have that compliance factor going for them. Um, Ali, so you were one of the first companies to have an MRB account in the state of California um, as an extension of Partner Colorado Credit Union, which has their own extension called Safe Harbor. Um, can you kind of speak to how Safe Harbor is expanding their framework and their services to the rest of the nation for the different cannabis operators looking for banking solutions? Yeah, definitely. Um, so for us as a software company, uh, we started working with Safe Harbor um, late last year, sorry, early last year. Um, Partner Colorado is a credit union bank in Colorado that's been operating since 19, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's been there for a while. And they, in 2015, they established um, a kind of like a DBA, a separate entity to uh, bank the cannabis industry, which is called Safe Harbor Private Bank. Um, and last year, they wanted to kind of uh, move from Colorado to also to California and kind of expand uh, their, you know, their market. Um, and they worked with companies that were ancillary, that were not touching the, the plant directly. Um, so that's why our company was one of the companies that got chosen to actually uh, get an MRB bank account because uh, we do software. Uh, but even with software, because we transact everything online, um, credit card companies like PayPal and Stripe and Authorize.net and all the other ones uh, look at us as a, a, a high risk because the transaction is coming directly from uh, an illegal activity. Even it's, uh, we, we, we sell ticket, digital tickets for events. Uh, because it's cannabis only event, our revenue is coming 100% from that industry, um, they still consider us as a high risk. Not as a high risk as a, there's different MRB tiers. There's uh, a tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one is like manufacturing, you know, actually touching the plant directly. Uh, tier two is basically, you know, software. Uh, companies are offering services to the tier one uh, that, you know, make majority of the revenue or, you know, all of the revenue directly from that uh, tier one. And there's a tier three, which is people like accounting, uh, you know, they work with other industry, but they provide some services to the space. Um, so for us, when we worked with uh, Safe Harbor Bank uh, last year, uh, we really wanted to kind of have, like, well, you know, kind of saying a very transparent relationship with them in the beginning. Uh, we had to show everything from, you know, our back, uh, our back in software, how compliant it is, uh, how we work with our clients, who our client were, uh, three-year tax returns, uh, pictures of the office, you name it. Uh, we had to jump through it, and we don't touch the plant. Um, so with Safe Harbor. Their program is basically, um, they have a separate team from the actual bank, the partner of Colorado, that, facilitates, like, that controls these accounts. They have specific bankers that deal with marijuana-related bank accounts, uh, so that, that way they're not kind of tied up together with the main uh, entity, which is partner of Colorado. So that program, the Safe Harbor program, that basically what they do is they almost audit our company every quarter, in a sense. They file these reports called SAR reports, suspicious activity reports, and those also have different tiers. Um, they file these with FinCEN, um, as uh, Andrew was saying, um, and those also have different tiers. So there's a marijuana uh, limited uh, SAR report, which basically you're not breaking any of the rules, you're following by the guidelines of the Coleman Miranda, you're actually operating legitimately. Uh, there's also another one where it's called a marijuana, uh, sorry, uh, priority, yes, what it is, priority uh, SAR reports. And that's if you're kind of, they're suspicious, something is not right, maybe you sold some client to outside the state. Um, and also there's one that's a marijuana termination uh, SAR report, where they know there's something wrong, this account has to be, you know, closed. Uh, so you have to always be maintaining these relationship, your business, how it operates. As new regulations happen, you have to kind of be on top of that. And that's what kind of really the program is, and that's what they're trying to expand it um, and kind of have allow other banks that are interested to bank this industry to kind of adopt a program like that if they want to to kind of bank, uh, you know, the cannabis space. You know, because here's one of the problem with the banks and credit unions is they, they can't take an unlimited number of MRB accounts, right? You know, once you start getting a, a certain concentration in any segment in a bank, your regulator starts getting nervous. Right? And so when they see, all right, you've got too high a concentration, even in MRB, that regulator can come in and say, all right, 
we think you've got enough accounts, we don't want you boarding anymore. So the idea that one institution can come in and save all of California, that's a myth. The same thing kind of goes with the state bank or the idea, the concept that, well, let's just form a state bank to bank marijuana. Well, that has a number of other issues as well outside of that concentration of, of that one industry, but you still have to have a master account. You know, and, and as the Fourth Corner Credit Union knows very well, getting a master account for the purpose of the banking of cannabis is very, very difficult. That's, that's well put. In fact, um, Safe Harbor in Colorado has, has pretty much reached their limit. They're doing about $85 million a month in deposits in Colorado. Um, they have 10 bankers handling about 10 cannabis accounts each, and then they've got another banker that handles uh, ancillary businesses. They do very, very rigorous uh, compliance checks before they will bring on an MRB. It's by referral only. You cannot get an account at Safe Harbor unless you are referred to Safe Harbor by another cannabis business. So hats off to you and a feather in your cap that, uh, <laughs> that you were able to get an account there. I got lucky on that one. <laughs> And, and, and you know, Ali, you were, you were talking about the different types of tiers of MRB, and so those tiers came from ACAMS, which is a, a, an association of money launderers, not money launderers, but those <laughs> anti-money launderers. And, and you know, there, there is some question as to really, you know, who is an MRB? You know, who is a marijuana-related business? And when you look at the FinCEN guidance, if you take it to the letter, theoretically, if you derive any revenue from marijuana, you are a marijuana-related business. Now, in practice, a lot of the banks and credit unions are giving some latitude in that, but if you want to take it to the letter of the law, you know, once you get that first dollar, you know, technically you could be classified as a marijuana-related businesses. And a lot of these MRBs, they get their accounts shut down all the time. Either they're not transparent, you know, as Ken was talking about transparency, so they're either not transparent, you know, or, you know, they pretend they're something else. You know, they say, all right, we're a nursery, we're a flower shop, you know, we're a consulting company. And, and you know, basically, they're putting their financial institution in a, in a very precarious situation because now that institution is not following the guidelines by the U.S. Treasury, right? So it becomes very difficult in that. Great. Um, so kind of, you guys kind of touched on this already, but for the operators, future operators, and ancillary providers in the space, um, could you briefly discuss kind of the steps they can prepare their companies for an MRB account? Sure. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, I, we can get a little more granular with it. Um, you know, be prepared to provide the bank with a complete copy of your application for your cannabis license, whatever uh, type of license or multiple types of license, licenses that you have. Um, that's a good starting point. So make sure that you keep track of all your documentation, hire a very good attorney to help you file uh, for your marijuana license, and be prepared to just hand that package over uh, to, the, uh, to your banker so they can start their know your customer due diligence on you. Um, keep track of every dollar that you've raised, and we're gonna talk, about, I think about capital raising a little bit later, but keep track of every dollar that you've raised and who it came from. Who gave you that money? Who invested that money? How did you check them out? You know, it wasn't from, you know, Medellin, Colombia. So keep track of all your investors and vet, vet your investors. Because if you've got a major investor that has a, let's call it a checkered background, um, that can absolutely trip you up as you try and get your, either your cannabis license, because they're going to run background checks on your major investors, and it will certainly uh, trip you up with respect to your bank, because chances are they're going to run background checks on you as well. We've had background checks run on us for every bank account that, uh, that we've opened for PayQuick across the country. They've run multiple background checks. And I'm not talking about, you know, live scan checks. I'm talking about FBI, blue and white, ink, fingerprint card background checks. Um, so that's a, a good way to, to get started and to get ready for that. And, and you know, another thing that you might want to be expecting is that you know, expect to be supplying the documents as if you were getting a commercial loan. So if you're going to get a loan from that bank or credit union, expect that level of documentation. So expect not just your corporate tax returns, but personal tax returns, financial statements, uh, leases, so everything you can think of if you were getting a commercial loan, plus 
all the items that Ken mentioned on the marijuana related business, you know, aspects of it. Yeah, I think, uh, to be honest with you, like going through the process last year, uh, it was too big to kind of, you know, digest in the beginning of how much troops you have to go through to get a bank account. You can be selling t-shirts or anything and get an account right away. So really being transparent is really the only way to kind of do this. Um, you know, speaking about investors and like that, we even had recommendation letters from our investors written from them. So that way we have a full transparency that, you know, they're recommending us, that we're understanding who our investors are, um, everything, even the facility that you operate. You have to take pictures, you know, send it to them so they know you're operating under the law. You know, every little bit of piece about your industry or, sorry, about your business that you're actually doing, you have to kind of, you know, hand it out to them. They have to vet you out before they can even, you know, move you to the next step and actually understand the business model, how it works, how the money comes in from your business to them and back. Um, the way they kind of pulled me, the way I kind of go about it is the more I'm transparent, the more I'm compliant, the more they're safe, you know, and to me, I'm okay with that because they offer me a service that, you know, it, it's hard to get, so. The, the only other thing, if I could add to that, um, is be organized. You know, don't dump a banker's box full of random documents on your bank and say, you know, go fish, here's our disclosures. Um, you don't look organized, you don't look like you have your know what together. If you can, organize your documents, index them, tab them, you know, so it's, and make, your bank banker's job easier to vet you. Be organized and clear and concise when you provide, because it's it's going to be you know a foot to two feet of paper that you're going to be supplying to them. So make it easy for them to go through, find what they're looking for, um, and you're just you look that much more professional as an organization when you present yourself that way to your banker. They're going to trust that wow they did all this to put their application together they must be running their business properly as well. And, and you know, there are, there are banks coming online in California. Now, you know, we've had marijuana in California for over 20 years, and there are a lot of people that have had accounts for that long as well. Uh, you know, some of them are just uh, at the, I'll call it like at the branch level, and you know, they may be at a big name bank, and only that branch knows exactly what they're doing, so corporate doesn't know, but they've been doing it that way for 20 years. But one thing also to be thinking about is what we call legacy cash. And legacy cash is all of that money that you have before you opened up that account with that institution. Many institutions will not accept legacy cash because they don't know where it came from. I mean, basically, you come with a backpack full of cash and say, all right, here's my first deposit. Here's my open deposit. And just know that they may say, hold on a second, guys. No, 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 we're not going to take that. So they may start right when you open that account with accepting monies for, your, for, for deposit. And I think that's a great point, Andre, with respect to both the legacy cash and what happens when you open your account. First of all, there's, if you have legacy cash, and the latest estimate I heard is there's about a trillion dollars in cannabis legacy cash sitting out there. And if you happen to have a few of that million dollars, don't expect to bring it to your bank. And don't buy into these real estate schemes and gold schemes where they're going to take your cash, we're going to buy real estate and send you back a check, or they're going to buy gold. Um, we've seen them at, at trade shows. Stay away from those guys, even if they say, oh, this was blessed by our lawyer. Well, their lawyer is an owner in the company. So um, there is no real solution right now for getting legacy cash back into the system. I suspect in three, four, five years, we may see some type of amnesty program from the federal government. They'll tax it at 25% and you'll be able to bring your legacy cash in. But right now, it's useless paper and you're just gonna have to sit on it. The second point, as you mentioned, as soon as your account is open, be prepared to be able to justify to the bank where every dollar came from that you're depositing in that bank and be prepared to justify and to demonstrate to them that every dollar comes from a state legal sale of cannabis because they will ask you and they'll ask you again and again and again. So you need to be prepared to prove to them with documentary evidence and software systems and the seed to sale traceability system, et cetera, that every dollar you've deposited in that bank comes from a state legal sale of cannabis. Yeah, we actually developed a technology at Hyper that integrates into a number of seed-to-sale systems. And so our bankers in real time are seeing transactions as they occur at the dispensary. And so they know exactly what were legitimate transactions that were being reported to the state. And then they can only accept those deposit amounts that match up to their point-of-sale system.
Great. Um, Andre, you and I kind of touched on this offline about, I mean, you mentioned the legacy cache and a few other things that current operators are doing over the past 20 years of having their version of an MRB account. Can you discuss a little more in detail um, some of the current fashions they're operating in that will no longer be complying in these new age MRB accounts? Well, well, certainly. All right, so if you're an MRB, actually, how many MRBs are in the audience? Do we have a few? All right, so we have a handful. You're, you're desperate. You're desperate for an account. All right, your hands are tied. Yeah. I mean, you, you can speak. 11 months. 11 months. There yeah. you are. 11 months. And, and so you're willing to look at almost any solution, partial solution, gray market, black market. You don't care. If someone says, hey, I think I can help you out here. Oh, here, I, I got this offshore bank account. Or here, I, I got a credit card processor that'll take your credit cards. Or even things like, a, like an ATM machine. Some people think, well, what's wrong with an ATM machine? Well, a lot of money gets laundered through ATM machines. Right? These MRB accounts, they're, they're, they're cash intensive accounts. All right? Even if they weren't MRB, let's just say they were money service business. It's hard for money service businesses to get an account and to keep an account. All right, and so all of these things bring inherent risk into the system, and it scares bankers. Bankers hate the unknown, all right? They scare very easily. But we've seen script machines, ATM machines, reverse ATM machines, all kinds of uh, gold exchanges, uh, anywhere from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I'll send you some money in Bitcoin, and then we convert to Bitcoin. So, so you have the, the, the digital currencies in there as well. And so none of these things are sustainable long-term solutions. They're all very, very short-term. And in many cases, that MRB is gonna lose some money. All right, they're MRBs that have gone with offshore processing or gray or black market solutions only to have their money seized. And they've lost six figure you know, deposits or six figures in value because they were using solutions that, that really weren't appropriate. And I think you make a really good point in that when, when folks come to you and they say they've got you know, a solution, that they've solved this issue, do your due diligence on them. Ask them, how long have you been in business? Are you licensed? Who licensed you? How exactly are you running these uh, transactions? If, if you come to PayQuick and you want you know, a PayQuick account, we're a, a MSB, a money services business with a, and a licensed money transmitter, ask us, how long have you been in business? Let me talk to your regulators. Let me talk to your bankers. Vet these companies when they come to you. And, and the ones that hold up to that vetting will be legit. Most of them won't, but if you find one that can hold up to that vetting process, vet them. Because MRB is a bit of the Wild West. And you know, the, the, the solutions or the proposed solutions you know, aren't, they haven't really, the regulation's not there yet. And so everyone's trying anything and say, all right, we think we can make this work. And so they'll, they'll try to sneak something by, you know, without even thinking about the long-term consequences. Yeah, I honestly uh, think uh, in this industry, because it's coming from the black market to a mainstream market, a lot of the junk comes with it as well. Um, so definitely do your due diligence on people that, you know, they offer these MRB accounts or different solutions of, you know, uh, transacting or banking your money. Uh, because the right way to do it is, you know, have an actual bank account like any other business. Um, so it is hard to get these accounts. Uh, for me personally, I knocked at so many doors, so many people told me to get out of their office, we don't want to work with you. The second I mentioned cannabis, uh, and I do software, so to me, I, I was blown my mind that why can I get an account? Uh, but eventually, if you really want to run your business legitimately in this industry, um, you know, you'll find a way to work with a bank that's actually understand what kind of business you are, and they're looking to work with you as well. And uh, like Andre said earlier, there's about 400 uh, institutions that are actually banking the industry. So the easiest way to get these accounts is just kind of online, searching, calling, emailing, until somebody opens the door and says, hey, you know, we are welcome to, working to work with a, you know, a marijuana-related business and bring you on board and kind of just follow those processes that we're kind of we're speaking on and having your ducks in rows. And, you know, again, make sure that whoever's answering the door is, is a legitimate business as well. Nice, thank you for that. Um, leading into our next question. When it comes to different payment solutions, what are the options out there? So there, there's a number of different options out there depending on, on what you're looking at. Um, on the debit and credit card processing side, um, you'll see uh, credit cards come, you know, people come into your store offering you a credit card terminal. They will miscode those transactions 
Um, there's something called a merchant category code that every credit card uh, merchant has to have, and you have to tell them whether you're a donut store, a restaurant, a shoe store, you know, a Pilates studio, whatever. Well, there's, there's no merchant category code for cannabis. So they miscode it as a wellness center, as a yoga studio, as medical equipment. Um, and find, ask them, you know, how are you coding this? And the reason being is that if you are caught by Visa MasterCard miscoding your transactions, your merchant account, you get put on what's called the terminated merchant file or the match list. And that is a black ball list where you will never get a credit card account again for that business. So you do not want to put a credit card terminal in your store that is miscoding your transactions. The other thing that you see out there is they'll offer you a credit card terminal and they'll say, let's just send that money to a different bank account, you know, open up a different bank account as a real estate company or a management company, and we'll just process those credit card payments through to that alternative company. Well, that's essentially money laundering 101, because you've got funds from the sale of cannabis going to a business that has nothing to do with the sale of that cannabis. You might as well be sending it to a Cayman Islands account. So don't do that. You will get yourselves in a lot of trouble. Um, there are other uh, solutions out there that use Bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh, to process cannabis transactions. We encourage folks to stay away from those. There's nothing that's going to invite scrutiny from Jeff Sessions more than using cryptocurrency in your cannabis business. Moreover, most banks and credit unions will not accept funds that ever have ever been in the form of cryptocurrency. So take Washington State, for example. There are eight financial institutions in Washington. Only one of them will accept funds that have ever been in the form of cryptocurrency. The other thing to worry about with respect to cryptocurrency is that uh, Chase, um, Citibank, uh, um, Bank of America have all said you cannot use a credit card to buy cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. They just outright prohibited it. The ones that still allow it, Visa MasterCard came out a couple of weeks ago and said, if you're using your credit card to buy cryptocurrency, we're going to treat that as a cash advance, and the customer is going to be hit with an extra 5% charge on their credit card because they're making a cash advance. So in our opinion, we counsel all of our clients to stay away from cryptocurrency, and we don't touch cryptocurrency at all. Um, you know, this is obviously not a commercial for for PayQuick, but we're, uh, we're, we are a payment solution that provides both a B2B payment hub and then for dispensaries, a business to consumer payment hub that works much like your Starbucks app, where consumers can load their PayQuick account, go into the cannabis business, and use that PayQuick account to make their purchase. Um, but that's pretty much all I want to say about that. And, and uh, if you guys have other solutions that you've seen out there. Uh, for us personally, because we don't take any cash, our entire platform is uh, online. So all the transactions are credit cards and uh, debit cards. Uh, so for us, in the beginning, when we were building the software, uh, we wanted to work with companies that were, again, allowing us to do this, uh, you know, without, without hiding or like creating another entity or building a fake website or any of that. So we talked to a lot of different credit card companies. We went up and down to try to get somebody to work with us. Some people will give us the approval, the salesperson, we operate, we sell one ticket, they shut us down, we have to go through again. So we eventually found somebody that was willing to work with our bank to allow us to take these transactions. Um, so we introduced them because we had such a good relationship with the bank, uh, we actually introduced them to the bank and now we have a secure kind of environment for our clients where they can operate, sell tickets, that money that goes through our platform, goes through our account, is counted for and also as we deposit it to them, uh, it's also counted for. Um, so there's nothing really impossible to do. If you can talk to these people, they, if you're in their shoes, they see this as an opportunity as well, but the risk is the biggest factor. So if you can minimize that risk for whoever you want to partner up with or work with, um, you might get a yes. You know, you might, somebody will say, hey, I'm willing to do this if you, know, you follow these rules and make sure you, know, you operate correctly. Um, so for us, it was huge because nobody, everybody was focused on the cash aspect of the industry, uh, but software companies don't take cash. We take straight out tr transactions. And um, they considered Visa and MasterCard considered them. They're coming from an illegal activity. Uh, no matter what kind of a sale is it, you know, even it could be a piece of glass or anything, anything, you know, in our sense is digital ticket. Um, so 
building these relationships with these companies and being transparent with them to really operate legitimately is the only way kind of to do this, uh, especially with payment processing. Because right now, when it comes to Visa and MasterCard, they're, they're no bueno. They, they don't want to work with anybody. Uh, but the, some credit card companies look at the cannabis space as a high-risk industry, like uh, the gun or alcohol or uh, there's so many different industries that are considered as high risk. Um, so they're willing to kind of work with you depending on what kind of company you are. If you're not selling cannabis on the website or products or anything like that, uh, which we don't. Uh, so to us, that's kind of the always our end is say, hey, look, like, you know, we're a legitimate operators. We're doing everything right. We even have a bank account. Uh, we got a referral from the bank to, you know, say, hey, we want to work with you guys and just kind of connected them together and it worked out for us. So. And with, oops, we have a question. I'm curious to know two things. For the PayQuick model, it's we're presuming that there's a bank account somewhere for that money to flow into, or you provide that service as well? Um, in the state of Washington right now, if you want a bank account and you're with PayQuick, we can get you a regular business bank account, and the business knows full-blown uh, that you are a cannabis business. Um, a lot of the functionality of our platform provides um, all of those same features, a bill pay feature, so you can pay your electric bill, you can uh, pay anyone not within the PayQuick platform with our bill pay feature, and then obviously within PayQuick on the business to business side, you can pay any of your suppliers, whether that's a cannabis supplier, whether it's a landlord, an attorney, an accountant, as long as they have a, a PayQuick account, you can also pay them. Just like with PayPal, you can always pay anybody else that has a PayPal account. So we provide that functionality, and we do that for a number of um, outliers, you know, people, growers maybe that are located in a remote area. Um, they use those services quite a bit, and we'll also pick up their cash with an armored car and take it to a counting room, and it gets counted, deposited in the Fed, and credited into their PayQuick account. Fantastic. Thank you. And just another quick question about the, with the merchant accounts, how are the, the, paraphernalia products being charged and how are they being categorized? Because we've been able to buy those for, you know, 40 years, 50 years. How are those being treated if it's just, you know, papers, pipes? Well, that's a great question. I know in Washington, you're not allowed to, um, typically they'll set up a, a, um, a paraphernalia store next to their cannabis store and sell it separately, but they're still having problems getting bank accounts as well, strangely enough, even though, you know, I mean, when we were all growing up and there were head shops and stuff, right, you could use a credit card at a head shop, um, but if there's an affiliation with a cannabis business you, you, and the money's going into the cannabis business, so if you've got a cannabis dispensary or retail store and you're selling glassware as well, you're just, you're not going to get a, uh, a, a credit card account legitimately or very very high risk uh, I mean like a high percentage it's like you pay nine percent per transaction or something like that which is ridiculous for any business to operate you know with a high you know interest rate like that there's possibilities but again that service that kind of operation with those kind of companies is not as good as a you know legitimate business that's running a legitimate operation and going back to the payments so hyper offers a payment solution for the retail side from the consumer to business we've had that out in the marketplace for about a year now and then we're entering into a couple of different products here shortly. One is uh, in conjunction with MJ Now. And so you have the ability to have a pre-delivery or like an order, place that order online, have it paid electronically with Hyper, automatically goes to the seed the sale system, automatically goes to the dispensary, and so it can either be delivered or picked up utilizing this payment technology. And also we're introducing a B2B product that's actually the first B2B product with level three equivalent data. Level three data is an extra layer of information that passes along with the transaction for additional transparency. Great, so um, Hi. Uh, just a quick question. Okay, so um, you guys were basically talking about earlier about the 400 national banks here in the US that are basically compliant to using cannabis money. Uh, I just have a quick question about what kinds of lending are these banks typically open to? Are they typically open to all types of lending, or are there also restrictions put on that? I'm only familiar with one institution that's lending to the MRB space you know, in the United States right now. You, you have a couple of issues. One is when you're lending money to an MRB, are you facilitating with your federal money, your federal, federally held money, facilitating a federally illegal activity? 
but more importantly for the bank or credit union, you have the perfection of collateral. And so should those assets, be it property or inventory, whatever it is, should those assets be taken, what does that institution have to get their money back? You know, and believe me, banks and credit unions, they don't want a vault full of pot, all right? So they don't, they don't want to have to go and collect to try to, try to do that for, to, to get their money back on a loan. Yeah, yes. let's say that for, uh, for example, you're going to be going into a leveraged buyout of a completely, you know, compliant company, not marijuana related with the, with the funds that you made from cannabis. Would that be something, since you're still going to have actual collateral on the, on the buyout, uh, would, would you still be able to go forth with that kind of a transaction, with that kind of lending? Well, I think, I mean, as, as, as Andre mentioned, the, the lending space is very underserved right now in the cannabis. You mentioned an LBO with, with yeah. cannabis funds. You first got to get those cannabis funds into some form, type of electronic form. Got it. Right? And so, right. and if it's legacy cash, there's no legal way to get your legacy cash into an electronic form right now. Um, so you just, you, you can't do that. Um, with respect to lending, there are a few private lenders out there, um, but they're lending on equipment because they can foreclose on a piece of extraction equipment and sell that piece of extraction equipment elsewhere. You can't foreclose on, on flour or any cannabis product because the bank has no ability to sell that, that flour or that cannabis product because they, they don't have a cannabis license to sell it. So lending is a, is a huge problem in the industry. There are a few private lenders out there that are looking at it, but mostly, again, with a script with respect to things like equipment financing or something they can actually foreclose on and sell. Can you wait till the mic gets to you? Um, thank you. A couple of things, Ali. Um, yeah. My understanding with Safe Harbor is that they had exhausted their capacity and that they were really going down the direction of working with other financial institutions to train them as to compliance. So my question is, is your account with them in Colorado or with the local entity? My other question is, how are the banks looking at CTRs and SARs? CTRs to me are almost superfluous for us because everything we're going to deposit is going to be cash. SARs similarly by nature are kind of difficult to quantify. And if we're depositing a regular amount of cash on an ongoing basis, I wonder wh whether an SAR would even be justified. Thank you. Yeah, um, so for us, uh, basically, uh, the first part of the question is um, what Safe Harbor is doing when we started working with them, they were trying to break ground in California. And uh, they were trying to implement their uh, program they established in 2015, the Safe Harbor program in California, but with other banks um, that, was, that were willing to, to do this program. Um, so I know, I'm not 100% sure the banks themselves, but I know they think this too. In California, they're trying to implement that kind of uh, process, that kind of uh, uh, program, where they have a separate entity completely from the actual bank and they can house these accounts. Um, so that's kind of really what I know they're, kind of, they're trying to do uh, to kind of you know, expand the model and have a turnkey for these banks who are willing to work uh, with uh, a marijuana-related business. Um, so that's kind of how what's going on with that. For us, we got lucky because some of these accounts were being uh, kind of closed or shut down, so we kind of got in early on and, and, and made the cut, if that makes sense. Um, so that's how that's the, the, the idea is to kind of implement this uh, program in other banks, uh, either credit unions or private banks. They're willing to kind of do the same thing and dedicate time and employees and you know the whole shebang to actually you know monitor every account and handle every account and. Um, so for us, regarding deposits and uh, money, because we are uh, online, everything's online for us, the only thing we report is um, our deposits that we send, the wires that we send to our clients, because we work with event organizers that sell tickets, so we, that money comes in, we send it back to them. So for us right now, checks or we don't handle cash, uh, but other than that, we do everything online, you know, through a phone, take a picture. Uh, but the idea is if, if the actual bank was here, then we can just walk in and actually deposit with our bank. If I could respond to your question regarding CTRs and, yes. and SARs, no problem. Um, you know, a CTR stands for a currency transaction report. And anytime a financial institution, or actually anytime anybody receives more than $10,000 in cash or traveler's checks or cash equivalent, you must file a CTR, a Form 8300. 
and that applies whether it's a, uh, a grower who's received more than $10,000 from a dispensary. And in fact, in, um, in Colorado, the IRS has come in and started to audit a number of cannabis businesses who have received multiple payments in excess of $10,000 from their dispensaries and retail stores that they sell to, and they've not been filing CTRs. There's no harm to anybody in filing a CTR, a Form 8300. So whether you're a lawyer, an accountant, you sell bottles like a Kush bottles or, um, or supplies to a cannabis business, file the CTR if you get paid more than $10,000 in cash. There's no harm to that. It's not going to trigger any additional scrutiny, but it is a legal requirement to file it. Absolutely. The bank will be filing a CTR when you're dropping money on them, but there's no problem with that. And the bank, if you happen to have an account with them and you're depositing any money from a cannabis-related business in that account, they're going to file either a marijuana limited SAR, a marijuana priority SAR, or God forbid, a marijuana termination SAR. And so, um, and in, in fact, with PayQuick, whenever our clients deposit money with us or we pick up their, their cash with an armored car, we file a marijuana, we file a CTR, and we also file the marijuana limited SAR. Um, and on occasions, we've had to file priority SARs and, and termination SARs. Um, so the banks will be filing it, and that's part of the big burden that the bank has from a compliance standpoint is keeping up with all these filings. And I know Hyper assists with that, with your program to assist the banks in, in filing their SARs. Um, and, and because we actually take possession of the money at PayQuick, we file those SARs and CTRs ourselves as well. So hopefully I, I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, no, it's obvious that the banks need those CTRs. Uh, and the guidance that, that you were under Can I answer your question? Um, because it, to, to really explain the difference, because um, it's, it's important for people to know. So a suspicious activity reports, or SARS, they've been around for a long time. And any time a bank is suspicious about what their customer's doing, whether it's child pornography, arms dealing, human trafficking, and they're taking in deposits for, that seem suspicious, they file a suspicious activity report on that particular deposit. Well, cannabis funds is from a f an activity that is illegal on a federal level. So the banks would have to file a SAR, a suspicious activity report, on every dollar that came in from a cannabis business. That's number one. Fortunately, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Unit of the Department of Treasury, they got wise. And they realized that if banks are serving this industry, FinCEN is going to be inundated with suspicious activity reports on every single cannabis deposit. So they said, and how are we going to distinguish a marijuana SAR, you know, from a marijuana activity that's operating in compliance with state law, not implicating the Cole Memo, from a child pornographer or a human trafficking ring? So what they said was, in their FinCEN guidance, they said, if, if you're taking in cannabis funds and you don't think there's anything suspicious about those cannabis funds other than they come from marijuana, we want you to write marijuana limited at the top of the SAR form. So we want you to file the SAR, but write marijuana limited at the top, and FinCEN will then know, okay, this is from a garden variety marijuana business that's operating in compliance with state law. It's not implicating any of the eight enforcement priorities in the Cole Memo. You're cool. If the bank thinks that there's something wrong, you know, it's a little bit suspicious. Maybe they did an inspection and something went wrong. You, we want you to write marijuana priority at the top of the SAR form, which tells FinCEN that something is a little bit askew with respect to this particular client, and we see a marijuana priority SAR. Now, things have gone completely off the rails, and, and the bank really thinks that there's something wrong with this cannabis business and where this money's coming from. We want you to write marijuana termination at the top of the SAR. And that tells FinCEN that something with respect to this cannabis business has really gone off the rails and it's going to invite additional scrutiny. So I hope that answers your question on the different types of SARS and when to file them. And Andre probably has yeah, good the, knowledge and, and on this too. Lord, there's a recurrent requirement 
And so, so every 90 days, so you've got the initial SAR when the account is open, and then every 90 days thereafter, that institution has to file another SAR. In regards to your CTR question, normally in a regular business, if you made cash deposits as a typical part of, of running your business over 10,000, you could get an exemption. So you could actually have a CTR exemption with your bank under certain circumstances. Marijuana related businesses are not eligible for any exception, right? So every CTR must be filed on an MRB. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, any other questions out there? Yeah, uh, I had a question. So uh, ba basically for me, I'm big into the uh, cryptocurrency and all of that. I'm a money services business and all of that ha have been for a while now. So uh, say that I wanted to get into the payment processing like uh, what you guys all do. Uh, isn't that still federally illegal? And uh, what, what type of uh, things have you experienced uh, getting into banking the cannabis industry? that is keeping the other guys out? Well, clearly <laughs> clearly, what, what we're doing um, uh, at PayQuick on a federal level is illegal. Cannabis is illegal. It's a Schedule One controlled substance, and we are handling funds from cannabis businesses on a federal level. It is illegal, you know, and uh, plain and simple. It's not illegal under state law, and there are guidelines out there that tell us what we need to do and how we need to do it. And so those are the, the Cole memo, notwithstanding that it's been rescinded, I think it's a really good idea to continue to abide by it. The FinCEN guidance has not been rescinded. That is out there. And if you abide by the Cole memo, the FinCEN guidance, you do what you're supposed to do under the Bank Secrecy Act and the anti-money laundering control laws, then you really got to, gotta, here's another pun, bank on the idea that, you know, that you're not going to be their target. They're going to go after the person who's cutting corners. Right? No local U.S. attorney is going to be able to further their career at DOJ by going and trying to lock up a company like yours, like ours, that is doing everything right. It's dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. They're going to further their career as that local prosecutor by going after the bad actors. I think in this space, uh, just uh, I think if somebody's pointing a finger, point ten back. You know, make sure that you have everything, you know, ready to go. To you know, if anything does happen. Um, you have everything lined up, and that's our motto is, you know, somebody's pointing a finger, point ten back. Uh, so that way you're safe and, you know, you can operate in this industry legitimately. But, but yeah, if you're looking at starting a payment processor for, for marijuana-related businesses, you have a number of obstacles. One, you have all of the MSB requirements, and, it's, and, and I think we mentioned before it's difficult even for non-marijuana MSBs to get banking. And then secondly, you have money transmitter laws within the various states, and so you may have to go to every state that you're operating in and then get that money transmitter law. You know, we came at it at a different direction, and so we are a, a regulatory compliance company to the financial institutions. And so we're not, I'm going to say, processing the payment under the name uh, or for the purpose of Hyper. We're doing these payments and the technology for the benefit of the financial institution. All right, I have a question for Johnny, just for the sake of clarity. We were at a summer event a couple of weeks ago in which, as far as structure, it says if you have a holding company or a co-op, and maybe some of the uh, companies that are involved in the co-op are involved in the dispensary of marijuana, but the holding company is not, it's more of a management, then you can have a banking relationship. Did I misread that? It seemed like that's kind of contrary to what I'm hearing tonight. I would repeat to them what you heard, because to be honest with you, they're the banking professionals and that's why we brought them out here. But so if you're just kind of repeating that question, they can probably address it since they deal with it on the day to day. Yeah, that's not permitted under Malcursa. You know, now that we have a regulatory and licensing framework in California, those, we don't have collectives anymore in California and all the hoops and all the machinations that people would do like that to get, our, to operate their collective and try and get a bank account. We don't have that anymore in California. We have a, we have Malcursa which is a regulatory framework for licensing cannabis businesses, and you need to be operating within that regulatory framework or you're operating illegally. It's that simple. Did that answer the question? Yeah. You, you used to not be able to form an LLC. You had to be a nonprofit collective. Now you can be a for-profit corporation, an S-corp, an LLC, a limited partnership, you know, what have you. It, it, you can be a legit, you know, legal entity without running, jumping through all those hoops 
under Malkursa and be a for-profit business. You have the microphone, I think. Yes, thank you. Gentlemen, to whoever wants to answer, uh, it's about non-cannabis-related CBD from the hemp plant. Tell me a story about that. Well, recently, CBDs, as you probably well know, were labeled, were classified as a Schedule One controlled substance, and they all lost their credit card processing. They were, <laughs> they all lost it. Um, it has not come back. Um, I'll tell you that at PayQuick, we are launching a e-commerce solution for CBD companies that will enable them to again start accepting debit and credit card uh, sales over the internet. Um, but we have not launched it yet. We're looking probably 30 days out. Um, before we're ready to roll that out. But CBD companies have been hit very, very hard. Um, and it's just, there's, as soon as they got labeled as a Schedule One, they all got their accounts shut down. Um, and, and notwithstanding that you see CBD being sold at uh, Bristol Farms, it's not CBD, really. It's, it's hemp oil. So be careful with that. And right. Andre, you've got something to add. Well, yeah, I mean, on the hemp side, it, it, it's, it's okay. Federally, it's okay. Right? But it just has this bad reputation. And so, uh, as Ked mentioned, a lot of the acquiring institutions that were processing credit cards, you know, jumped out. But just know that that's changing. So we're actually in discussions with several institutions that are looking at getting back into the hemp CBD credit card processing. They look kind of it's cannabis, so it's kind of it's different. It's not. I agree with you. I know. Yeah, it's not. But that's other institutions that are new to this industry or new to this kind of business. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of distinguish the difference, especially if you're not educating them or they don't know what kind of business you're operating. Yeah, the first thing you got to do when you decide to get in the cannabis business is take any idea you have of fairness or rationality and just throw that right out the window. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not really sure how to work this. Okay, um, yeah, kind of in that vein, um, you know, working with banks in general. Oh, uh, working with banks in general. Um, have you seen where you have to go through a very expensive compli pro compliance process ahead of time and then uh, the, the account uh, servicing on the compliance side, if they are, they're filing the CRTs, they're, they're doing the SARS, they're doing the pickup and, and monitoring of all the uh, deposits daily um, through the armored car services. What, it, they're extraordinarily expensive. I'm from the banking industry, and I mean, I tried to look at usury laws, and I just couldn't find anything there. So there are, um, it really depends on the state. In Washington state, if you want a normal marijuana business bank account, it's gonna run you about $450 a month. In Colorado, uh, when we first went to Colorado two years ago, it was between seven and $14,000 a month for a bank account, okay? So it really depends on the state because of, well, compliance monitoring and just gouging of customers, okay? So, um, you know, I really, in California, with, with the few financial institutions that are, are serving the industry here, um, I don't know exactly what their rates are, so but I would speculate that they're probably in the neighborhood. Oh, you know what their rates are, so tell us what their rates are. Yeah, I know. Uh, they wanted $6,000 up front for the initiation of the process and all the compliance. All right, so he, I'll, to repeat the, the answer, they wanted $6,000 to go through the, the application process. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and then they're charging you $1,200 a month. And, you know, with the banks that you're working with, what kind of fees are they charging? If, if I have to get an average across the U.S., it's probably about $1,500 a month, you know, plus some basis points on the, the cash or the deposits. So it's, it definitely depends on the business. Uh, for our business, because we're a software company, we pay less than 500 bucks a month uh, to maintain everything. And it goes up uh, from there, depending if you're a distributor, if you're a manufacturer. So it dip depends on the location you are, the state you're at, what kind of business you are. Uh, but a lot of these fees, for me, I'm happy to pay them because it allows me to operate legitimately. Uh, if somebody's watching my account, you know, doing that work, and I'm okay with that. So, but it does vary depending on the, uh, the, the bank or depending on the business you have. And some of them in the 8,000s I've seen. Uh, a month, you know, just depending on the volume you bring in. Um, so all those kind of matter, you know. So as earlier we were saying, when you talk to these institutions or these banks, know, you know, all these things, ask these questions. What are you going to charge me? What is it a month? Is it a percent? Just kind of know around what, what kind of a program they're running. Uh, but everybody varies depending on the business. And it varies by the company that you're 
business and location. Yeah, stay. Yeah, yeah. Correct. It, yeah. it varies by the type of business, you know, even among different plant touching businesses or whether you're ancillary, yeah. you know, and, and how close you are. But, you know, I'm going to put on my banker's hat. <laughs> Compliance is not free. All right. No. All right. And, and they have to do a lot of work on these accounts. So it, it's, it's not easy for them. And so what we advise our clients is that charge something fair that covers your costs with a reasonable profit, but don't gouge the MRBs. All right. You're very loyal people. And if you're treated fairly, if they're honest with you up front and you're honest and transparent with them, that's a long, sustainable relationship. And you're not going to leave them at some point. There's going to be compression in the marketplace. And as more and more banks, like we have two new institutions last month. I've got two institutions that are going to come online in about three months and another two before the end of the year. There are more banks and credit unions entering the space. And so charging you know, 10,000, 15,000 a month is not going to last. And as soon as someone comes in and says, hey, I'm, I'm going to charge you 1,000 or 1,500, you're going to jump shut real quick. It becomes kind of a commodity right now. So. <laughs> but eventually that will change. I have a question, another question, and I don't, I apologize if it's, if it's not for this forum, but as a business entity, I would qualify as a consultant. I have a consultancy that's nine years old. I have a, a, an S corporation. To start a consultancy in the cannabis industry, should I do a DBA under my current one or start a new one? Do you recommend? I, I personally, I mean, uh, we have Event High Inc. and we have Event High uh, that we, we run uh, as, a, as a DBA that we use on our software and our marketing, all that. But with the bank, they know both. They know everything, uh, both points of, I guess. But they're the same business, right? Yeah, they're the same business, yeah. yeah. I would be if, I could respond, if I could respond for a second, because um, I don't admit this a lot, but um, I've been an attorney for 30 years and was a, a corporate real estate and compliance attorney before uh, co-founding PayQuick. And so if I put my lawyer hat on and tell you, if you've had an, an existing and established consulting business for nine years and you want to start a consulting arm and consulting in cannabis, form a separate legal entity and get a separate bank account for that entity. Do not do it through your existing nine-year consulting business. Thank you very much. Um. Simple question, but I, and I know that you've really alluded to it and, and defined it, but I'm not entirely clear on what is a marijuana-related business. Is it just simply a business that could be getting money from a business that is getting money from marijuana? Like, how ancillary is, a, is technically an MRB-related business? Okay, all right, so I'm going to go back to the FinCEN guidance from February of 2014, and it actually uses the word derived income, all right? So technically, theoretically, if you derive income from this federally illegal activity, you become an MRB. Now, Ali had mentioned the tiers, you know, the ACAMS tiers, which are becoming pretty generally accepted. And so product touching is at tier one. Tier two is businesses directly supporting the product touching. And then the tier three is, is this incidental. You're an attorney uh, that just does a little MRB here and there. You're an accountant that does an MRB's taxes. So it's clear as mud. And a lot of it depends upon the financial institution. I look at a lot of financial institutions, marijuana policies, and some have put an arbitrary percentage. Some will say, all right, if it's 20%, I've seen 20% in a number of policies. It, if it's 20% or less, we're not gonna consider you an MRB. All right, others will take it and be more strict with that. All right, so it was gonna vary by financial institution. All right, but know that your, your big box banks, they don't like marijuana, all right? And if you have something like marijuana in your name, you're going to have a lot of difficulty getting the account. And when and if they find out, they're gonna close that account, they're gonna find your personal accounts, they're gonna close your personal accounts too. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, um, again, we're software, so we're ancillary as, as it gets. We don't sell the plant or nothing like that. Um, but I think if you're operating the space, you're an MRB. Um, and that's what it is. It's just your, it's a, it's a type of an account for that kind of an industry. Um, there's different due diligence they do on you and the SAR reports and everything we talked about. But that's what it is. It's basically is just a label for the bank to know that this account is, you know, a uh, marijuana, uh, marijuana bank account, I'm uh, sorry, marijuana business. Um, so it doesn't matter if, again, you're selling hats or long as it, it's in that space, uh, it's coming from uh, cannabis activity, if it's 
whatever it is um, you label as an MRB uh, a business. Yeah, and I think that the, the tiers that you mentioned and different strategies that or stratospheres that different levels that banks have, but if you're getting paid with money that came from the sale of cannabis at any point in time, you know, many banks and the big boxes will label you as a marijuana related business. So we got time for one last question. Are um, marijuana business employees, when they get paid by a check, are they in risk of getting their personal accounts shut down? In a word, absolutely yes. Absolutely That's yes. Nice. No question. Um, we've had employees in, in our company who's have, who um, have had their bank accounts shut down by Union Bank. They, realized, they went on the website, they saw that they worked for uh, PayQuick, and Union Bank shut down all of their accounts. So it's, it's a big, big problem. And many employees in cannabis businesses have had their bank accounts shut down because they work in a dispensary or a grow operation or manufacturing operation. I don't know if anyone in your I, company. For, for us, uh, because we have the MRB bank account, we can pay our employees you know, with checks and deposits and stuff like that. So we haven't had any issues directly with employment, but I know some of our clients get scared that when we deposit money in their account, uh, we have uh, high in our name, event high with, with an HI, uh, but they, they're scared you know, that when the deposit comes through that their bank might flag that and shut down their account. Uh, so it's definitely it's a huge issue, but um, um, there's no, really there's no way around it just yet. So that's going to end it for the Q&A. Uh, can we get a round of applause for the speaker?